Good evening and welcome. Tonight, we will be continuing our read-through of this book called History of the World, Map by Map. And tonight, we're going to be looking at maps of Asian kingdoms and empires and dynasties, things like that. We're in the medieval section of the book. If you have not seen a video in this series before, my whole gimmick is that I don't read anything in advance. In all the books on my channel, I read them in advance. Uh, but this one I don't. I'm going in totally blind. We're exploring this whole book together. So, this is going to be long. Let's get into it. I have a feeling it's going to be a very long video. So, we're starting off with Tang and Song China. Let's see, first box is right here. It says the unification of China 590 to 628. After the fall of the Han, China broke apart as a series of dynasties, mainly originating in nomadic groups from the north. Unity was briefly restored in 590 when the Sui dynasty took control but their expensive wars against Korea and the Turks led to the dynasty's collapse in 618. After a period of chaos, the young general Li Shimin restored order and placed his father on the throne at Gaoju, the first Tang Emperor. By 628, China was united once more. Now, I know it's Tang Empire, but it's one of those things in American English we say Tang when referring to this point in history. It just is. But here you can see all in purple the Tang dynasty. You can see it following the rivers here, right? Getting out here and being silent. Well, number two is the Central Asian Empire, 629 to 751. Turkic invasions threatened China in the first years of the Tang, but in 629, Emperor Taizong defeated the Eastern Turks. He later sent armies into Central Asia, establishing protectorates in the western regions as far as Kashgar. The Tang lost some territory in the 680s, and their expansion westward was halted when a Tang army was defeated by the Arabs in the Talas River. 751. So we see the Western Turks over here, the Eastern Turks are over here, and these areas were under Tang control, it says. Interesting. We've got some other boxes down here. The Hushan Revolt. Uh oh, I can't fit this in. I gotta squeeze you down here. The Hushan Revolt. 755 to 763. Discontent grew in the Chinese army following a series of military failures in Central Asia. In 755, a revolt broke out under the Anlushan, a general under Anlushan, a general who captured the imperial or western capital at Chang'an in 756. Although he was assassinated the following year, it took until 763 to defeat the last rebel army, by which time Tang control over the provinces had been seriously weakened. There's a little star there for the Tang capital, which sounds like it was Chang'an, which would be right there. Then we have the Tang collapse, 763 to 907. After the Anlushan Rebellion, local military governors gained more power, despite efforts by the Emperor Zhang Zhong to stabilize finances and subdue rebellion. Thereafter, court eunuchs, castrated men who were employed as imperial servants, if you don't know what a eunuch was, gained dominance over the bureaucracy and army, and factional strife crippled the government. In 907, Zhu Wen, a military governor, deposed the last Tang Emperor, Ai Wen, and established the later Liang Dynasty. Never heard of the Liang Dynasty. Then we have another map over here. Let's see if I can get 
that in frame. This is about the Song Dynasty. Let's see, the Northern Song Dynasty, 960 to 1126. From 960, Emperor Taiju conquered and reunited much of the land that had once belonged to the Han and Tang empires. He imposed high taxes on the peasantry, and when Jurchen nomads invaded the north, they faced little resistance. In 1126, the Jurchen took the Song capital, Kaifeng, and the Song court fled to southern China. So all the yellow you see here, including Hainan, is um, part of the northern Song empire. Now here's the southern Song dynasty. From 1127, the surviving Song governed from Hangzhou in southern China, while the Jurchen, as the Jin dynasty, ruled the north. In 1233, the southern Song allied with the Mongols to attack the Jurchen. But after destroying the Jurchen, the Mongols then invaded the south in 1268. They took Hangzhou in 1276, and three years later defeated the last southern Song forces. So all the purple you see here is the southern song. The arrows here are the different Mongol attacks that happened coming up here. And there. I'm pretty sure this is a page coming up about the Mongols. There's a little box here we'll read. It says 1279. Mongols defeat the Song fleet. The last Song emperor, seven-year-old Zhao Bing, drowns. So that's unfortunate. Let's see. All these boxes over here. It says here in 751, Tang forces are defeated by Arabs at the Talas River. Here it is then. 657, the Tang defeat the Western Turks and control the area until the rebellion in 665. Here in Tsungar. 645 to 769, Tsungaria was occupied by Tang China. Down here, circa 600, Tibet is unified and begins rapid expansion. And then in 750, the Tibetans lose much of their territory to China, only to regain it and expand again in the 780s. Where's the key? Okay, a dragon means under China's influence. So we had Zungaria, which I love. There's Tibet. Um, Bohai. And Sia, which I think, and Japan which we're going to talk about on the next page. And then down here is Anam, which is Vietnam now. I think we'll talk about that too later on. I think. I just only read the titles. The 8th to 9th centuries, the kingdom of Bohai is a tributary state to the Tang Empire. 668, I think it says. No, that's a 668. 660, 660. It's a line right there going through. I can't tell if it's a zero or an eight. A major Tang invasion conquers most of the Korean kingdoms of Sia, but the Chinese are forced to withdraw in 676. Down here we have these other areas. In circa 700, Nanjiao is unified and begins expansion. In 679, the Tang Protectorate of Anam is established. So I didn't have to point those out, apparently. I just talked about it already on the boxes, but that's I wonder what happened to Hainan when, um, if they lost it, because see the map over here. They had Hainan, but then it's not part of the Southern Tang. So what happened in Hainan, I wonder? Is it just chaos again? I don't know. Next we have Medieval Korea and Japan. I've got to turn it sideways to read this map. These are both long peninsula and island countries, aren't they? got to have a long map. First we have Korea, the Unification Wars, 370 to 668. From the 4th century, the Kingdom of Pakche, Korguyo, Sira, and Gaia Confederacy were fighting to gain control of Korea. Exploiting the Chinese Tang Dynasty's rivalry with Goguryeo, Sira forces enlisted the help of the Tang army to crush Pakche, and in 668 CE, they took to the Kogryo capital Pyongyang, uniting Korea under King Munmu. I should note that I am not fluent, but I can speak Korean and Japanese. 
I can I can speak Korean and Japanese, okay? I know enough Korean to get around. I know way more Japanese. Um, I've been teaching myself Japanese since I was 12. I've been learning Korean since, gosh, well over 10 years, maybe 12, 13 years. So I'll be able to pronounce things better. <laughs> I'm trying not to flex saying Pakichu. Um, but it is hard Anyway, I'm gonna stop flexing. Um, Pekche is the orange. Pekche. Uh, Kolokoryo is in blue up here. And Sira is yellow. All this yellow here. I guess, I guess it's all Sira, right? I guess we'll talk about this green in a minute. Um, the Tang and Sira campaigns are these purple arrows here. Coming up from China. Gaia is the purple. Oh no, this is Sira. But it says it's yellow. I don't know. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah, okay. The yellow is Sira from 670 to 935. This pinkish color is Sira from 57 to 668. So you can see just how much they expanded, right? Major battles are swords, you can see there. And sieges are these little circles. There's other battles. I don't see any more. I see other symbols, but I think I'll talk about them down here. The rise of Goryeo, 889 to 935. After two centuries of Sira rule, rebellions led by provincial warlords caused the Korean peninsula briefly to divide into three parts, or the later three kingdoms. In this new era, the reformed Kogoryo state, Goryeo, which is how we get the word Korea, possessed the strongest military. In 935, Goryeo commander Wang Gon captured Gyeongje, the Sira capital, and reunited the peninsula. So Goryeo is all of this green you see here. And their capital is the green star here, Gyeongje. Then we have Goryeo, Korea, which is like a, what's it called when you're saying the same thing twice? <laughs> Goryeo is where the word Korea comes from. 935 to 1393. The demand for luxury goods increased, and the local handicraft industries grew during the Goryeo era. The capital, Gangyeon, grew into a major trade hub, with overseas links to the rest of East Asia. Goryeo also adopted the Sun branch of Buddhism, which it proclaimed the religion of the state. In 1270, Goryeo rule fell to a Mongol invasion, and the peninsula became a vassal state to the Yuan Empire. So all their trade routes, you can see all these little trails here in the ocean, going to China, to Japan, beyond. And their capital is the Red Star which was, they said it, Gyeongyeon, right up there, but anyway. Then we have, over here in Japan, the Nara period, from 710 to 794. In the early 8th century, Japan adopted a Confucian bureaucracy based on the Chinese model, which included a centralized revenue collection system. Under Empress Genmei, a new capital is built in Nara, replicating Chang'an, the Chinese Ten capital. Besides Chinese influence, Buddhism also shaped Japanese culture during the Nara era. The Nara is over here. There's Nara. Then we have Japan's Heian period, 794 to 1189. Emperor Kanmu moved the Japanese capital to Heian-kyo, which is Kyoto today in 794 CE, marking the start of the Heian era, which saw the noble Fujiwara family rise to power. The family presided over a period of great artistic and literary achievement, during which Japan broke away from Chinese influences and established its own culture. So there's Heian Kyo, or Kyoto today. Then we have the rise of the samurai. 900 to 1868. The 
From the early 900s, weak Heian rule caused dissatisfaction to spread across the provinces. Nobles began hiring warriors to safeguard their own interests, giving rise to the early samurai. By the 1100s, provincial lords were fighting one another for supremacy, which culminated in the Minamoto clan seizing power after defeating the Taira clan in the Genpei War. Yes, a very famous time in Japan's history. So Minamoto's campaign was these blue arrows. You can see him going north. And going way south here, down to there, down to there, getting all of these territories here, closing in on Hakata. My goodness. Um, okay, what in the world? It says, okay, do you see this key? Minamoto victory, Minamoto defeat. Oh, I was about to say, I was like, these are the same color, but I get it. The swords are pointing up if Minamoto Yoritomo won down if Minamoto Yoritomo lost. So let's find some that looks like he lost here, um, but won here. Um, that's a win, that's a loss, that's a win, that's a win, that's a loss, and that's a win. <laughs> wow. And the Fujiwaras are up north. The Minamotos are in the center, and the Taira's you can see a little bit in the center, but mostly the south. And all of Kyushu and Shikoku. And then we have the Kamakura Shogunate. In 92 to 1333, Minamoto Yoritomo founded the Kamakura Shogunate in 1221. The Shogunate re-established contact with China which resulted in Japan absorbing new sects of Buddhism, in particular Zen Buddhism. The shogunate appointed its own military governors, or shugo, as heads of each province, and named stewards to supervise the individual estates into which the provinces had been divided, thereby establishing an effective national network to maintain stability. Let's see all the little notes here. 1183 victory at the Battle of Kuikaratani turns the tide of the Genpei War in favor of the Minamoto clan. 1189 Minamoto defeats the Fujiwara clan. Um, let's see, battles. Oh, I see this. The battles Kuikarataru, Shinoha, Ishibashiyama. Oh, I see. Mizushima. Anyway, looks like the only other ones are in Korea. 668, Tang and Sira siege of Pyongyang forces Goguryeo rulers to abandon the city. 663, Tang and Sira army crushes the Pekche, the victory of Pekgang. Interesting. It's a very neat time period to research the, the Three Dynasties era here and the the rise of the shogunates um i mean not great for the people living there because it was kind of chaotic at the times but from a historical perspective super cool to learn about those times let's move on to the mongols the mongol conquests we're starting off with genghis khan conquering asia from 1206 to 1227 under genghis khan Mongol raids into northern China turned into a full-scale campaign in 1211. Meanwhile, Mongol forces marched westward, besieging the Karakitai cities of Balasagun and Kashgar. When a Mongol envoy to the Khwarazm Empire was slaughtered in Otrar, the Mongols sacked the major cities of the Islamic Empire. In 1219, Genghis Khan chose his third son, Ogdai, as his successor. So all these purple arrows are Genghis Khan's campaigns. My goodness. Okay, wait. There's a lot. There's Karakuram, right? So he's heading out to China, obviously. That was a big deal. Uh, this looks purple here. Oh, that's... No, it's not. 
we'll talk about that later. That's the Kamikaze. Um, we're heading this way, okay, into Central Asia, attacking all these cities here. Um, we're going down here toward India, we're going this way through Iran, I guess Persia at the time, then up past the Caspian, heading into like west or yeah western russia my goodness this man went everywhere let's see what ogadai did next ogadai khan invades europe 1229 to 1241 following genghis khan's death in 1227 ogadai officially ascended the throne in 1229 ogadai directed the mongol campaign to europe in 1236, Mongol forces captured and destroyed major towns, including Vladimir and Moscow. In 1241, the Mongol army crushed Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria. The untimely death of Ogadai in 1241 stopped the Mongol army from advancing into Western Europe. So his arrows are pink. So we can see him going through China like crazy. Right? Yeah. And then all through here, heading up into Europe, there's Moscow. Um, there's an arrow over here, the Bulgars. And then, you know, heading this crack house, it's Poland. Goodness. And these people went all over the place, just conquering as they went, didn't they? And we have defeat at Angelut. 1251 to 1259. Under Great Khan Manka, the Mongols overthrew the Abbasid Caliphate, brutally sacking Baghdad and destroying the city's grand library. Manka's death in 1259 prompted part of the army to return home, and the rest suffered defeat at the Battle of Anjalut against the Mamluks, an Islamic army of slave soldiers who ruled Egypt and Syria from 1250 to 1517. So Manka is the green arrows. So this dude also went into China. But then he's also over here. Um, doo -doo -doo, sacking Baghdad. And heading down um, the Levant here. And there's Angel Loot. He was defeated. Then we have Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan takes China 1251 to 1294. Grandson of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, overthrew the Song Dynasty in 1279, which we just read about, and conquered the whole of China to establish the Yuan Dynasty. He gained the loyalty of his Chinese subjects by employing many in his administration. In 1277, he launched campaigns against Burma and Vietnam in what was a decade-long war against the Pagan Empire. So Kublai is purple... Wait, Genghis Khan was purple. Okay, wait. He's more of like a black purple. So he's going all over this area of China. His attempts into Japan, which... Are they going to talk about the Kamikaze? When they tried multiple times to invade Japan and lost because of the weather? Do they talk about that? I don't know. Maybe it will. I don't know. Then we have the four... Khanates, 1259 to 1411. A single Mongol ruler could not govern the vast imperial realm. In 1259, the empire was divided into four Khanates. Each of the four realms was ruled by a descendant of Genghis Khan, the Khanate of the House of Chagatai, the Ilkhanate of Hulagu, the Golden Horde of Burke Khan, and what became the Yuan Empire of Kublai Khan their borders. You can see the empire of the Great Khan here. Then we have the Chagatai Empire. There's the Ilkhanate here. And then the Golden Horde is all this here. Interesting. I've never seen the borders of all the different Mongol regions. Let's start over here in Europe. 1241, a 30,000 strong Mongol cavalry crosses the frozen Vistula River to invade Poland. Wow. Over here it says 1241, 
Mongols destroy a Polish-German army, opening the way for further conquest in Europe. Wow, it's like how much history would have changed if the Mongols went further into Europe, right? 1260, a better knowledge of the terrain helps the Mamluks inflict first defeat on the Mongol army. 1258, a 12-day siege ends with the brutal sacking of Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. On 1221, Mongols pursue Mamluk leader Jaladin, defeat him at the Battle of Indus. 1209, after defeating a western Shah force led by Cao Longhui outside Wutai, Genghis Khan captured the city and pushed up along the Yellow River. 1215, Mongol siege starves the Jin Chinese capital's inhabitants into submission. And we have 1293, when he tried to invade, um, Indonesia and Mongolia. It says Kublai's campaign against the Javanese kingdom of um, Singasari ends in defeat, the loss of 3,000 elite soldiers. From what I read, they couldn't really advance into Indochina and the Malay Archipelago and Indonesian islands because of the humidity, because they had never dealt with tropical weather, and they were like, it's gross, I can taste the air, this is horrible. It looks like they made it down to Pagan. I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about it on a different page. I'm going to tell a story about my cat. Um, I once had a dream that my last cat, the cat I had for 19 years, um, I had a dream once that he just looked at me and said, and he just spoke and said, you need to respect me more. My ancestors fought alongside Genghis Khan. And I woke up and went, what in the world was that? So I researched and it turns out that Genghis Khan, he would be outside a city trying to break in, and he would get cats and tie like flaming sticks to their tails and send them in through the walls that they had broken through so that the cats would set the city on fire and they could invade. So, my cat's ancestors fought alongside Genghis Khan. And I'm sticking to that story. Let's see, we're moving on back to China. This is Yuan, China, to the early Ming. Let's learn more about because the Kublai Khan's down there. Let's learn more about it. Okay, so first of all, the Mongol conquest of China, 1211 to 1293. A series of great Khans overcame China in stages. Genghis Khan conquered the non-Chinese powers occupying northern China the Western Xia and the Jurchen people who had founded the Jin dynasty. Genghis's grandson, Monk Khan, then took the Dali Kingdom, which later became the Yunnan province of Yuan, China. Finally, Monk's successor, Kublai Khan, overthrew the entirety of Song, China, becoming the first non-native emperor of all China. Now the white arrows, they finally gave me a decent color, so I can actually see it against the map. They're bright white now. Coming in. Oh, there's Karkarong. And coming in. Oh, they're out here. Pew. And then the Yuan campaigns against the Dali and Song are these maroon arrows. So moving in there. Way down there. Going down and up. Over here. And even into the Korean Peninsula. And the key battles are these swords here. Don't see any key battles that are red. Right here, the Nyasha. Yeah, I don't see any, but maybe you guys do. <laughs> Alright, we're on to the Yuan Dynasty, 1272 to 1368. Kublai Khan proclaimed that 1272 was the first year of the Yuan Dynasty with newly built Kanbalik, or Dadu, which is modern-day Beijing, its capital. After construction was completed in 1293, Dadu featured a grand palace and huge fortress walls around its perimeter. I wonder if that became a forbidden city. Meanwhile, Kublai retained links with the Mongolian heartland, but 
making Chengdu the empire's summer capital. Let's see, imperial capital is a little green star. Little green star, so there's Dadu up there. Never heard uh, Beijing called that before. Do they have the summer capital, or was it? Chengdu? I don't know where that is. But. Oh, there it is. Chengdu. And then the. There should be lines, like dotted lines, setting the borders. But I don't see what they were talking about. Oh, is it these? No, that's the modern borders, right? These? No, because there's no Korea or Mongolia. So this must have been it. Borders here. Okay. And then down here. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I see them now. Let's read about trading worldwide, 1279 to 1368. The Yuan Empire opened China to the outside world resulting in the realm engaging in more extensive foreign trade than ever before. While the move saw a resurgence of the Silk Road, technological advances in shipbuilding and navigation led to the opening of new sea lanes to Southeast Asia. The city of Guangzhou became the most important trade port during the Yuan era. And here it's pointing out all the sea routes that they took in trading heading off to, you know, Europe and the Middle East and all that. Very neat. Next we have Luckless in Japan. Now we're going to talk about it. 1274 to 1281. In 1274, Kublai Khan dispatched a fleet to conquer Japan. Despite scoring some early victories, the Mongols were forced to retreat when a storm destroyed hundreds of ships many of which were flat-bottomed river vessels. A second invasion in 1281 met a similar fate, as the Mongol armada was unable to penetrate the Japanese defense wall and perished when it was struck by a typhoon. Now that's where our kamikaze comes from. It means wind of the gods. That <laughs> the gods came and destroyed the Mongols through storms, right? So the invasion of 1274 is this arrow here. 1281 is this arrow here. You can see the battles here. You've got Hakata and Hirado right there. The Grand Canal. 1281 to 1293. The Yuan rounded up 4 million peasants to work on a new direct route for the Grand Canal, the oldest parts of which dated to the 6th century BCE. The laborers carved a passage hundreds of miles long through hill country, linking the capital to Hangzhou. This allowed grain transportation to the north, further disenfranchising the populace. The Grand Canal is this blue line here, so you can see it right here, digging into the land, creating the Grand The Red Turban Invasion. I've never heard of this. 1351 to 1368. A series of floods and droughts in the 1340s was interpreted by the Chinese as divine signs of the Yuan having lost the mandate of heaven. The revolts broke out across the realm and gave rise to the Red Turban Rebellion. Led by Zhu Yuanzhang, the rebels drove out the Yuan court and seized the capital in 1368. Oh, okay. So what's the name for the Yuan being driven out? So these yellows here were affected by the revolt. I see their little fists. So there's Karakoram up there. We've got Chengdu. We've got... What is that? Yichang. Wuchang, Longxing, Nanking, Hanzhou, Yidu, Luo, Yao. I can't read that. <laughs> They're all names that don't exist anymore. So I don't know these names. Chongqing. Interesting. Then we have the early Ming, 1368 to 1398. Zhu Yuanzhong became the Honghu Emperor, the first ruler of the Ming Dynasty, which would rule China for the next three centuries. He took 
personal control of the organs of government and restored order throughout the country. That sounds so Chinese, the organs of government. He instituted public work projects and introduced reforms to redistribute land to the peasants. So the Ming Empire is all the yellow here. I was wondering when that was going to come into play. Including Hainan. And their imperial capital is here at Nanking. Very cool. Let's read all the little things here. First of all, we have 1281, Yuan fleet on a mission to conquer Japan comprises 3,500 ships, up to 100,000 soldiers. 1215, Genghis Khan destroys the Jurchen, or Jin capital of Chengdu. And in 1264, Kublai Khan orders reconstruction of the future Yuan capital. What else do we have? 1293, Mongol forces return after an unsuccessful invasion of Java. I guess that's the bad one. Oh, we've got some more over here. What does it say? 1253, Mongol leader Monke Khan dispatches Prince Kublai to take the Dali Kingdom, or Yunnan province. In 1273, Kublai appoints a governor to ensure taxes are collected for the Yuan. Wasn't that Marco Polo's job when he was there? He helps collect taxes. Anyway, I'm surprised they didn't talk about Marco Polo on here. Oh, yes they did. It's in this map over here. There's Marco Polo, who wound up being like a weird hostage there for, what was it, 17 years? Moving on to Southeast Asia. I'm pretty sure this is our last map. Yeah. Southeast Asia, which is just so fascinating. It's all the little things they don't teach you about in school that I find the neatest, like about Pagan and Khmer and all these places we're going to talk about. I love them. Uh, we're starting with the Gupta Empire, though. 320 to 500. Founded by Chandra Gupta I in 320, the Gupta Empire became wealthy from trade with Southeast Asia. Merchants carried Indian culture and religion overland and across maritime routes around Malaysia. Continual warfare to subdue rebellious provinces and defeat at the hands of the holy moly. Okay, defeat at the hands of the Heftalite Hun invaders of 455 hastened the empire's decline and disappearance in the mid-6th century. I have never seen that word. Heftalite? Just the Huns. You can't, can't you say the Huns? I guess that's different because the Huns were more like Eastern Europe. This is India? I don't know. Anyway, the pink here is the Gupta Empire and their influence is being spread across these arrows here, to there, down into the islands here, and then up. You can see there's Dali we talked about before. The Kingdom of Funan. 243 to 700. Funan, the earliest recorded state in the region of Southeast Asia, appeared around the 2nd century in the Mekong Delta. It maintained close trading links with China through an emporium at Ok O on the coast, sending an embassy there in 243. I did a video about the region where Ok O is. It's the coolest site ever. Although Buddhism was strong in the kingdom, Chinese records describe a king called Chan Tan, who sent tribute in 357 as a Hindu. So the yellow here is areas influenced by India. So all this is yellow here. It's all Indian influence, it says. Okay. Interesting. And there's Funan. The rise and fall of Angkor. 802 to 1453. That's another word that, um, that's not how you actually say it, but that's how it's said in English. Uh, a lot of Cambodian things are like that. The kingdom of Angkor began in 802 when Jayavarman II proclaimed himself what? Kakavartan? Kakavartan? It's another word I've never seen. I guess that's Angkor King, right? Kakravartan. 
and founded a new capital near the later site of Inkle. Subsequent kings established new royal cities nearby, each adorned with Hindu temples. Jaya Farman the seventh instead promoted Buddhism, but Angkor returned to Hinduism and survived until its collapse in the 15th century. So you can see Angkor here, and the outermost limits of Angkor is all of this pink here. Very, very powerful kingdom, right? Then we have the Buddhist kingdom of Bagan, 6 49 to 1287. Pakan was established in 849 by Burmese speaking people. Its power grew until, in 1044, Anahuara brought much of modern Burma under his control. Finally, defeating the Mon of Tatum in 1057, his descendants ruled for two centuries, but alienation of land to support its temples weakened Pakan and it easily fell to the Mongols in 1287. There's the court of Pagan along the Irrawaddy, and then the outermost limits, all down here, just all the way up there. Then we have the maritime state of Srivijaya, 671 to 1045. Unlike the land-based states, Srivijaya depended on control of maritime routes and the domination of trading ports and cities for its success. Based at Palembang on Sumatra, Srivijaya had close links with China and sent frequent embassies there. The appearance in the 11th century of rivals in Java, notably Kadiri, ended Srivijaya's empire. So there's the core area there on Sumatra. Their limits are way over here, and way up there. Um, Kadiri is the green, so their core area is here near Borobudur. Their limits are way up, it goes off the map. Interesting. Then we have Champa and Dai Viet. The Cham people established the Hindu kingdom of Champa in southern Vietnam in the 4th century. They waged frequent wars against their northern neighbors, the Vietnamese, who overran their capital, Vijaya, in 1471. The Vietnamese Dai Viet Kingdom developed in a region long overshadowed by China, achieving independence under Nguyen, which is probably super mispronounced, in 939. So the Champa Core area is. Oh, Champa's over here. That's right. And their limits stretched up here, nope, up here, because that's Daviet there, but there's their limits. I can't see the name of the city in that dark purple. Daila. Oh, I like that. That's pretty. And let's see all the little notes on this page. In 1287, Pakan falls to the Mongols. Pronounce it that way because it's a P or B sound. It can be spelled with a P or a B in English. So it's pronounced Pagan, like just barely use your lips to say Pagan. Right? 938, Vietnamese under Nguyen Quyen defeat Southern Han to preserve independence in Dai Viet. 1471, Vijaya captured by the Vietnamese, marking the end of the Champa Kingdom. 1130 to 1150, Suryar Farman II orders the building of Angkor Wat grandest of the Angkor temples. And in 1177, Angkor is captured by the Cham army under Jaya Indravarman IV. So nearby, in circa 700 CE, the kingdom of Chenla becomes predominant following the collapse of Funan. I love these names. They sound so mythical. They sound like fantasy names. 441, tribute from port of Con... what? Contili... 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 Oh, that's... now that I say it, that's really pretty. Which is an unknown location. We don't know where Contili was. Wow, what a... I love that. It's first mentioned in Srivijaya in Chinese records. And in 671, visiting Chinese pilgrim records presence of 1,000 Buddhist monks. Wow, 
I feel like we learned a lot in this video. I learned some cool stuff here. I really like this book a lot. Next, we're going to, I peaked, right? The end of this chapter is Africa, North America, South America, and Polynesia, which I'm also very excited for. Like this time period and all those continents. So I can't wait for that. Do I have that scheduled already? Um, I do, but it's not on my main calendar that I post it. It's gonna be in like mid-March, unfortunately, because I have lots to show you guys on my channel in February. But I had a lot of fun reading this, I always do. And um, yeah, so thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing, because we're definitely doing this again. And I hope that you have a good, 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 good night. Good night.